We're going to be continuing in our study of right and dividing the word of truth or what saith the scriptures. I would let me say this about JD's talk on Wednesday night. Before you even, if you want to have any preliminary stuff, before you even get into what we're doing here, then what he was talking about would be an interesting discussion. A very interesting study. Uh, because that's the way, and it's a, you can go, I said this Wednesday night, you can go into that as deep as you want to, but there's fundamentals of it that would be essential to knowing the Bible is the Word of God. And I would suggest that, again, I would suggest uh, Geisler or Nick's book or one like that. But that I, I suggested that one. I didn't mention this on Wednesday night because that book has been around for a long time and uses a textbook all over the place. That's one of the reasons they keep updating it ever so often, and I wasn't sure from the time I got my last copy how long it had been. But you found one that was, what, 20 what? 2012. 2012. And uh, it has a lot in there, probably wouldn't interest you, but I don't. They're not caught up in denominational doctrine, hardly at all, so you don't have to be that particular. So in proving that the Bible is the plenary verbal inspired Word of God, uh, how we got it together and all that kind of thing, or how it came together, it's very interesting. And it'll also introduce you much to archaeology. There are some books out there on archaeology uh, and the Bible that are very good. But, uh, again, that's another story. But I would say, if you had anything preliminary to what we're trying to do in this class and giving fundamentals of the right division of the Word, I would say that would be a good one to study pre previous to getting into this or studying at the same time. Um, but today we'll be back on this. And before we get started, let's go to Heavenly Father in prayer. Our Holy Father, we're thankful for the night of rest and for the freedoms we have in this nation to assemble as we are this morning. And may we lend our minds to the study of thy will. Indeed, we're grateful for it. Help us to be mindful that it is here because thou dost love us and hast revealed thy will to us. And it accommodates us, Holy Father, as thou hast made us to come to understanding and to be enlightened as to what we are and why we're here and to prepare for eternity. In the hour to follow this, may our minds be centered upon thee as thy word directs to worship thee in spirit and in truth. And may we day by day walk according to the authority of thy Son. Gracious Father, again we ask that thou would help us to be mindful of the brevity and uncertainty of life and the certainty of death and the judgment. But above that, for faithful children of God, the eternality of being in a glorified state with thee forever having died in the faith here. Be with the sick, the afflicted, the orphans. Be with those in countries that know not the freedoms we have. And we pray that thou wouldst help us to use these freedoms and not take them for granted. Spread the gospel, defend the faith. Holy Father, lift us up, strengthen us, help us to love each other. Help us to all love thee supremely with all we have and are. Defeat us in evil and raise us up in good. For we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Someone uh, tell me, by way of review, ages in which God has dealt with man. Okay. Anybody want to tell me the years involved? Patriarchal. That's exactly right. And then what's the next one? And how long went? 1,500 years. Now, how long is the Christian dispensation since that? I didn't ask that one, but that's what we're in. Not quite, because it hadn't been quite 2,000. <laughs> When's it going to end? When the Lord comes back, the end of the world. Now, applying that to the Bible, you have 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the uh, New. You have an Old Testament and a New Testament. What books of the Bible does the patriarchal age cover? Okay. Uh, what chapter in Exodus? Uh, chapter 30, 20. 
That's exactly right. Why does it stop in Exodus 20? The law of Moses was given to the Jews. Now I say it stops in Exodus 20 because the, the Bible is the revelation of God's dealing with man and the unfolding of the scheme of redemption. So the Bible is interested in showing that. It does not mention the fact that God loves all men, Jew and Gentile, because uh, that's not the purpose of the Bible, to tell all about that. But it does. Again, showing uh, Jonah himself under the law of Moses, preaching to Assyria mm -hmm. who had transgressed God's law, but they were not under the law of Moses. So what law did they transgress? Had to be the law of patriarchy. You're forced by, again, logical reasoning to conclude they had to. Is it possible to sin without law? It is not. A scripture that ought to be welded in our minds to tell us that is what? What scripture would you refer to to tell us that? 1 John 3, 4, where it says sin is a transgression of the law. American Standard says sin is lawlessness. So if without a law, there would be his sin because sin is a transgression of the law. So that always been law for everybody because Romans 3, 23 says what? All have sinned. Well, that's Jew and Gentile, isn't it? But that meant even while the law of Moses was the way the Jews approached God in that 1500 period year of the Mosaic law, the law period. Gentiles were there to sin too, but they weren't under the law. So how did they sin? They had to violate a law, it had to be patriarchy. So we must keep that in mind. Now, what did the majority of the race of Gentiles do? Romans chapter one. They, they left. And so you see the mess the world was in by the time that the first century gets here as to the immorality and the false religions. There, there were few people like Cornelius among the Gentiles, Acts 10 to 11, few people. But they were there. And we see one of them in Acts 10. So you can't say, well, he was a proselyte because proselytes were there on the day the church started, Acts chapter 2. They're listed, list of people. Again, let me ask, what is a proselyte? That chooses to be under the law and live according. And the Jews accepted them to a degree. If you went to the temple, the proselytes could not go as close into the actual temple because you had porticos, you had porches all the way around it. And uh, they were only allowed so close. So keep that in mind. But here we're in the early ages. Uh, these people that we're studying about now, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all those people, would have known nothing in the world about the tabernacle. They would have known nothing in the world about the Levitical priesthood. But let Moses, when he writes this, would know all about those things. Now here's something I, that you need to keep in mind as a, a rule of rightly dividing the word of truth. Many times, because Moses is writing this, Moses was under patriarchy, but the law came through him to the Jews, Exodus 20. So he made the transition, didn't he? From being under patriarchy to being under the law God gave to the Jews through him. So many times in writing, he writes, he will refer to it as it was at the time he was writing. Not necessarily mean it had that same name at the time it was actually happening. Now that's a rule that's not just peculiar to the Bible. It's a rule that has to do with reading history. Somebody says, well, a certain thing took place in 1850. Hear uh, about where cutting shoot is. Well, that doesn't mean cutting shoot was there then, but it means you know now where cutting shoot is, and that's where that took place then. You got to understand that about people writing history, and that's what they did. Do that a lot of times. <coughs> in this going those rules right now uh, so we need to emphasize if we're studying with ourselves and with others that right here in the beginning we see what sin is and that the bible begins to develop the way god would make 
um, the way God would uh, develop a scheme, a plan, whereby man could be forgiven of sins and be restored to his fellowship with God, and yet God would remain perfectly just. Now, you can't figure that out, how he's going to do that, just from reading the Old Testament. Okay, well, you know the Hebrew and everything else in the Old Testament. You won't be able to figure that out if that's all you know is the Old Testament. And again, I cite uh, Acts 10 and 11. Well, not that, really. Uh, I'm thinking more of uh, Ethiopian eunuch earlier. There's no way he could have known what we take for granted knowing because what did he have? What could he have studied from the Scriptures? What was available to him? That's it. The, the, the patriarchal part, of Genesis and so on, and then the law. And he couldn't figure that out. That's one reason that you'll find Jesus saying to the disciples at times that he wouldn't go into a whole lot of other things because they did not have the wherewithal in their background to understand it. Now that's a rule you might keep in mind, not for the same reason he did with the, with the apostles and holding some things back till later on they were capable of understanding. But that's true also of understanding who you're teaching. Don't assume they know some things that you may know. So it would be helpful to understand what they do know so that you can start there and move on. And don't take anything for granted because things are extremely uh, familiar to you. You can't, you can't assume that everybody else knows what you know. And that's a very bad assumption. It doesn't mean you know everything you need to know, but it means you may know more than one person. And if you're trying to convert that person and teach them to rightly divide the word of truth, that's just common sense. You think about secular teaching. Secular teaching, you've got to know where they are in their understanding. And, of course, the whole idea and the whole development of the educational process is have the different grades, meaning the different ages, and teaching them according to their own age. And, of course, you get down to where at this stage they should know this much, and then you can start there and go from here on and all that. But uh, the basic idea behind that is certainly a good one, and we need to know that when it comes to us trying to teach others. Hi, James. Good morning. Glad to see you show up. James has been away. James has been away working. Now, another point made that is in. Point B on page three under your under C and then two and then point B under capital C number two and then point B Romans ten seventeen whatsoever is not of faith is sin whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Some explain that to me in the context in which Paul is using it. Remember that in the context in which Paul writes those terms, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Anybody want to strike out on their own and try that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, look at the verses preceding. Um, so then faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word. Okay, question. First of all, what is a definition of faith? That's an explanation of it. That's true. That's an explanation of it. Nothing wrong with that. We are using this explanation of it. But what's an actual definition of it? Taking God at His Word. Um, faith expressed in other terms is one's confidence in another and in His Word. It's trust in another and the Word coming from them. But why does what the Word of God create faith? Beliefs the verb form. Why, why does it why does it do that? What, what about the Word of God that can create confidence in God in His system of salvation? What about it? It's just the other that He doesn't want. So by hearing His Word, you know that there's a truth behind it. What He says He will do. Or the proof of it. You can see the evidence that He's inside the Bible and outside the Bible, stacked up against each other. You see that in the truth itself. 
Well, the key is the idea of evidence. The Word of God contains the evidence necessary to prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. It does more than that, but we're, we're, think, we're thinking of Christ and a person coming to a saving belief in Christ as the only begotten Son of God and the Savior of the world. So when you say faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, somebody may say, how? Well, remember what we emphasize so much in coming to certainty, that is knowledge. You have to have evidence. Tell me how 1 Thessalonians 5.21 would compare to verse, seven, uh, verse 17, then we'll get a little later to the other one. Huh? Prove all things. The faith it saves in, in the Greek lexicons will usually say something like pistuo is the word that's, uh, or pistis is the word that's translated into English as faith or belief. It carries with it the idea of obedience. It's not just mentally assenting to the fact of a case. What do I mean by that? Well, let me say, J.D. Gunner is sitting here. We can define J.D. Gunner. We can do all those sorts of things. I mean, that man sitting right there that I'm pointing to, <laughs> he's sitting here. I can assent to that fact. What good does that do me? Somebody in the days of Jesus said, this is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I assent to the fact that he is a person here. What good would he do him? Well, your eyes can work and you still don't have to believe anything. Some people don't believe their eyes. <laughs> And James goes into an explanation of that in James chapter 2 as to when that fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the way, the truth, the life, no man comes to the Father but by Him, John 14, 6. He goes into pointing out when that happens. And it's far more than just assenting to the fact of a case. Because there's not any necessary trust in you in that person to the you could see a person um, walking a tire a hundred feet. You could see that and by your own empirical knowledge say Even James tells us that the devils have that same belief that the But there was no love nor confidence in them in him to save them. There's, they can believe all they want to that way, but they're still devils, aren't they? Or demons. I always call it the, you can't go to heaven on the devil level of faith. You just can't do it. So that's what we mean by assenting to the fact of the case. And that's what I was going to say in my illustration. is somebody I can see, and it's a fact this fellow can ride on a tight wire on a bicycle 100 feet above the ground. Don't expect me to get on the handlebars. Uh, don't expect me to try that person. Uh, so when we see then that uh, faith comes by hearing the Word of God, we realize what the Word of God conveys to us, which is the necessary adequate evidence to come to belief, trust, confidence, faith in God and in His Christ. So when he says whatsoever is not of faith is sin, what's he talking about? <coughs> He's not obedient. This is a good, really, that statement is good to parallel with Colossians 3.17. 
whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. We emphasize there you must act with the authority of Christ for it to be acceptable to God. That's what's being said by Paul here. Because faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And if you're acting without faith, without the authority of the Lord, and you can't act in faith if you don't have the authority of the Lord guiding you, then that's sin. What he's saying is, do not act without authority from the Lord. Because that's the way that you exercise your faith. You follow me? That's the whole idea. It's talking about things from two different ways, but the same thing. The same thing. So whatsoever is not a faith is sin. So if you're doing this, but you have no authority from the Lord to do it, I don't care how sincere you are, how sincere you are, or whatever. It's, it's not helping you. You can call it whatever you want to call it. But the Lord does that authorize you to conduct yourself that way. So what is it according to, according to Paul? It's sin. But sin is a transgression of the law. Well, if you don't have authority from the Lord then you don't have him in the doing of whatever it is you're doing. So you're not acting by his authority. You can't therefore act by faith because faith comes by hearing the word of God. So whatsoever is not of faith is sin. What he's saying is be sure that when you act as a child of God, a Christian, that you're acting on the basis of faith. But faith comes by hearing the word of God. Thus, Connect 2 Corinthians 5, 7 here. Paul said we walk by faith in what? Not by sight. We walk as the word of God leads us, guides us, and directs us. We form our views of all things as the word of God leads us, guides us, directs us, teaches us. And not as things appear just to our five senses. And he uses sight as a synecdo key apart, standing for the whole in this case, to represent all of the five senses. If you simply look at what happens to Jesus without knowledge of the Bible prophecies and all the things that he fulfilled, all the Bible says, the day that he dies on that cross, what hope do you have? If that's all you're going on. You don't because you don't have the knowledge that comes from the Scriptures. A great many members of the church today look at everything going on around us and say, Oh, woe is me. What are we going to do? Why do they do that? Because they're walking by sight. Walking by sight. I don't care what happens in this world. In the sense, let me underscore that, in the sense of it changing God and His will being done in this world ultimately and finally. Now, it may make a difference on you for a while where you are. It certainly made a difference on the children of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah when they were carried away into, into captivity. And yet, if they had known the Bible, they would have known that's God punishing you because you wouldn't believe and obey Him. And He gave you hundreds of years to change. You wouldn't, so now you must, you must be disciplined and they were for 70 years interesting that he told them he didn't say you're going to captivity i'll leave it to that he actually told them now you'll be there 70 years that's all there is to it you'll come back those that want to after 70 years so when you have the word of god you have insights that nobody else has you realize that regardless of elections <laughs> or regardless of who's at war with whom, or what country dominates this, or who's doing what to whom, is good, bad, or whatever, it does not change God and His Word. So the emphasis in the Bible regarding faith is that that faith is formed by the truth of God, and for it to benefit you, it has to be seen in your response by obedience to the Word of God, taking Him at His Word and obeying Him. And we have multiplicity of examples in the Old Testament of people who took God at His word because He's God and they complied with His will. And I guess we can say that Abraham is probably one of the, is, since the Bible calls him the father of the faithful, he has the greatest or serves as the greatest example among men in the Old Testament of what it is to be faithful to God. Certainly he went far beyond mentally ascending the fact of God's existence 
And the ultimate was his faith was put to the test. And that was done because what was right he was told to do was ordinarily distasteful, ordinarily wrong. Uh, but he did it because what? He took God in his word. And he knew God would work it all out. And he also knew the things that had been said earlier from God about Isaac. So he went through it. But now if he had just gone by sight, so to speak, use Paul's terminology, he would maybe have a complete different view of the whole thing. And people without the knowledge of God's will are throwing themselves wide open to all sorts of mental problems and emotional problems and because they're trusting in themselves, trusting other human beings, finite human beings, and, and, and therefore they, they don't see the future. Can you, can, can you see the future? Now you got to think about that for a minute. You're not going to see the future through the five senses. Nancy, is the Lord coming back someday? How do you know that? By faith. So there's no evidence. You just take a leap in the dark. Now I'm wanting to show you the difference. We've talked about it a lot of times, but right here's the time to nail, the, nail it down again. People will say what as far as their definition of what's been called the leap of faith. What do they mean by that? Well, it's, I would say it better this way. It's beyond empirical knowledge. They say that what you know is only what you can examine with your five senses. Now, there's no way that with your five senses, in examining what your five senses are capable of examining, that alone is going to tell you the Lord's coming back someday. But hang on, James. But what are the ways of coming to knowledge? How? Are the, what are the different ways of coming to knowledge, which means of being certain about certain things? Think of what you're doing right now and trying to answer that question. That'll help you answer it. Sign of an idea, a vehicle of thought. It's an idea again. Well, the thing I'm trying to say is that let me go back to my old illustration of a jury trying a case, or they're trying a case before a jury in, a, in our court system. Assuming, and that's what, anybody want to know what void deer is? Trying to figure out whether these folks can be objective in applying the law that applies to the case and to be able to know what is evidence, adequate evidence, and credible witnesses, so they can come to a decision. Why must they do that with the jury, with each one on the jury? Why, why must they do that? Okay. Uh, we might say an objective, rational decision or something, but, but what, is, what about them, the jury, in relationship to the case being tried before them in court? What about them? What's peculiar about them? Why are they there? They're going to render a verdict based upon what? Facts. facts in the case and whatever law may be governing it. Facts in the case. That's what the void is designed to do. Can you do that? 
Can you do that even though you may have prejudices or whatever? Can you do that? Well, because you're a person that can evaluate yourself and you can do it honestly, because you're a person that can uh, set aside your prejudices and simply do that, then everybody on that jury has to do that if they're what the juror was meant to be. So what, what are they going to make up their minds about? I mean, how are they going to come to the to concluding guilty or not guilty if it's, a, say, a murder case? How are they going to do it? What? And they got to know what evidence is, yes. And reasoning with that evidence. I found out the few juries I was on that the reasoning that goes on is that it, it's not any. But uh, not always. It's, the reason you got a multiplicity of people is that hopefully there's somebody in there that can point these things out, have arguments with them, and pull them all back to thinking straight as they're intended to. Now, the point is, they've never, with their five senses, seen this thing. They didn't witness the murder. They can't say, I saw him pull that gun and, and shoot him three times. With my own eyes, I saw that. They can't say that. Well, how do they know he did? How do they come with a, say he did do that? Well, all right, how do they know? It has to be the facts and evidence and adequate evidence and credible witnesses that, that causes them to be able to come to what? A decision, but it has to be what do they will tell them usually in the closing arguments of the, of the attorney? Okay, beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, there can be doubts. But what are you doing? Because you know yourself, you're a free moral agent, you can think, you can will, you can know when a preponderance of the evidence, what does that mean? You have Lady Justice with her scales, balance, balance <coughs> and the preponderance of evidence says guilty. This is what people don't understand about a system of faith, a biblical system of faith that saves us through the gospel. I learned a long time ago that in a formal debate, no matter how well prepared you are, you cannot stop the other side from quibbling. You can't stop the other side from quibbling. What's a quibble? What's a quibble when you say you can't stop the other side from quibbling? Coming up with some sort of something that supposedly is an explanation that says why what you're saying is just not the case. You can't stop that. What have you got to, what are you hoping will happen? What are you trying to make happen and what do you try to do? It's true of any time you teach somebody, folks. I don't care if it's one on one or a thousand people in the audience and you're debating this fella. Uh, what are you trying to do? For the honest hearted truth seeker you're trying to set forth the evidence that would make it all come down on the side that the proposition you're affirming to be the truth is the truth now the atheist is going to come back many times or the, or the person in error and try to say yeah but this yeah but that well, what you've got to do is say well all right but that doesn't set aside that the evidence is heavy enough to make it come down on the side of truth a faith system will always say, yeah, but, because faith system, what's the very nature of it? We walk by faith and not by sight. All right, we walk by the adequate evidence and the credible witnesses revealed to us in the Word of God. We prove it to be the Word of God in all the ways we've talked about, and we have that. What does it mean some people can't come along and say, yeah, but what if this and what if that? Well, you never will stop the what ifs. But what have you got to do for yourself? That's when Luke 8, 15 comes up. An honest and good heart. And the devil is going to try to say to you, no, you've got prejudices, you've got likes and dislikes. You, if you take this position, that's going to throw you at odds with this. And so you begin to... What did Eve do? 
in order to believe the lie, what had to happen with Eve. Well, the listening, but what made her believe it? It's exactly right. That's what everybody does when they leave the truth, when they know the truth. Eve knew God. She knew the truth. But what was about her that made her change? What made her rationalize? It tells you there. In so uncertain terms, it tells you. She let her fesh, fleshly appetites lead her away from the objective truth that God had told them about the tree in the midst of the garden. So we need to work on our want to, don't we? What do I really want? There's a host of people looking for things in religion that God never intended you to look for. There's a host of people in different religions because they found something that suited them, not because they sought to find God in His way and they were willing to alter their life no matter to what extent to be obedient to Him. Denominationalism couldn't exist without that. What do they say? The church of what? Your choice. Where do you find anybody in the New Testament saying, you're saved by Christ and I picked the church of your choice? It's all the same thing. It doesn't change. But when you operate by faith and not according to your five senses, which can only operate on empirical knowledge, things we can experience with our five senses in the present, then you're going to let the Word of God guide you. I know that God destroyed the world in the days of a man named Noah by a flood. Do you know that? Yes, you do. <laughs> you got to get your head working around. <laughs> do you know that? But you never saw it. You never smelled it. You weren't there if you'd been there. <laughs> that'd been the last place you'd been. <laughs> now that's assuming you wouldn't have been a person of faith and on the ark too. <laughs> but the point is, you never, you never experienced it's my point through the five senses. Well then how do you know it? But what does that mean? The evidence put together brings you to that conclusion. So there are two ways you come to knowledge. The world tends to say that the only knowledge there is is what you learn through what you can apply your five senses to. That's it. But just by our jurisprudence system, we know that's not the case because we expect juries to take in the adequate evidence and credible witnesses and come to a definite conclusion. How does a jury come to the conclusion a person's innocent? Well, yeah, they come to a decision, but how do they decide he's innocent? We've talked about how he decides that he's guilty. How do they decide he's innocent? There's not enough adequate evidence or credible witnesses to say, to, to, to lean that scale down on the side of, there's not enough evidence. So he must be innocent. Does that mean you, that he didn't do it? Or that you can't prove it? Why was... Um, um, what's his name, Chicago? No, no, O.J. Al Capone. Al Capone, thank you. My old mind is not reaching back there like it used to. Why was Al Capone, out of all the terrible things he did, just convicted on what? Tax fraud. Tax fraud. Why? They couldn't prove anything else but that definitely where it would stand up in court. That's why. So you can know a certain thing in your own mind but may not be able to prove it, which means you can't do what? You can't supply the evidence. You can't supply the evidence. What are the two ways we come to knowledge? Okay, it has to be empirical knowledge, which means 
examination of things we can experience with our five senses now, or it means you have to take in the adequate evidence, credible witnesses, reason correctly with it, and come to a conclusion. Folks, I've just described the way that you have faith in God. If your faith is not based on that, you need to reexamine your faith. And I think a whole lot of people do need to examine it because they may find out I'm what I am because that's what mom and daddy was or because my wife wants me to be or my husband wants me to be or my mom and daddy want me to be. Who was that that said, was it you, J.D., that said the book Faith Demand or Evidence Demands a, what is it? Yeah, Verdict. I've got a copy of that book too, but that's that's what you're doing. That's what the idea is behind that title, James. Well, you talk about faith. I personally get my example was, you know, if I believe that our actions are dictated by what we say, I have faith. I will get paid next week. There's no five inventory evidence right now as of today. When you went to work for that company, did they tell you anything? Or you just said, oh, I'll go to work for you? Well, they told me a whole lot of things. All right. Have any bearing on the job you have to do to get paid? Absolutely. All right. Then if you do the job, what do you expect? Get paid. You trust them that much, huh? <laughs> somebody get paid. <laughs> but it was. The point is that some things that we do so ordinarily, like going up to a traffic light, as long as it's working right, what do we expect when it says when we're looking at it and it says red? What do we expect on the other other areas? It should be green the other way. Or... Look at how you can trust your life to that. Especially when it says green and you go. Now, assuming people are going to keep the laws, because I've seen plenty of people around here. As soon as it turns red, they're still going. So you better halt a little bit longer after red. So the point is, though, why why do they have it? Red, green. You have, look at the trust you place in that. Now, when you left here this morning, from your home this morning and came here, did you place faith in anything? Great faith in it. You have to place faith in society that no one's going to get you. No, I, I, I'm talking about how you actually got here. Oh, that the car's going to work. Yeah, think about the faith you put in the brake system and the steering system. And if you really study that, it might make you begin to doubt what's going to work. And those sitting over there in the passenger seat have great faith in the person driving, Nancy. <laughs> well, this is all, every bit of it fits into this situation. It's not something that's a mild little toy we're playing with. We're understanding a very foundational matter of Christianity. It begins in the book of origins, and it starts right here with the idea of what sin is. And that gets into the matter of what faith is. And it gets in the matter of how you come to certitude about anything, how you know something. It gets you into classifying the two different ways you come to knowledge, the differences in that knowledge. Why is that important? Here's at least one big reason. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. What? Truth about how water heater works. Truth about how internal combustion engine works. Truth about the solar system. He's talking about spiritual faith where God has revealed himself in his word. Now, that goes right back to what J.D. did on, on uh, Wednesday evening. J.D. was giving us material and all those people who work in that field, giving us material that proves. It proves what? That the Bible is the plenary, verbal, inspiration, inspired Word of God. I'm not trying to give you, I'm just trying to make you apply this to every aspect of your life. It's there, always. You're either walking by knowledge that comes through five senses, or you're walking by knowledge that comes through contemplation of the facts that are revealed in the Word of God. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And thus we sin when we violate the Word of God. Any comments or questions further on that? If you're going to study with somebody, spend a lot of time on this. Because the world tends to say, where the empirical knowledge ends, 
faith begins because they don't believe faith involves evidence. They really are saying when they talk about the leap of faith, they're talking about where you leave knowledge because they don't accept one kind of knowledge. And where you just have, well, I hope it's that way. Sounds good to me. I feel better when I think that way than when I don't. That kind of thing. But it's not. It's not at all. And I use the court system simply to show that we depend upon that uh, knowledge that comes through evidence and witnesses. So does the Bible. The Bible does that. What does Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do? It offers you what about Jesus Christ? It offers you evidence. And you need to approach those four books in the life of Christ to realize that's why they're there. But it starts back over in Genesis. And it has to do with how we sin. And that has to do with faith. And that has to uh, do with the Word of God and why the Word of God creates confidence, faith, belief, and trust in God and His system of salvation. Any comments or questions? I want to leave you with something to study about and think about in Genesis 3, 14, and 15. Are they still meeting over there? I, you're probably familiar with this. It says the seed of woman in, in Galatians, uh, I mean Genesis 3 and verse 15. Do you think if you were just reading this and knowing what you do about biological makeup of man and woman, would, would there be something in that verse that would catch your, catch your attention or draw your attention? What would it be? Huh? No. But that's not, that's true when Paul uses it over in Galatians 3, but that's not what it is. What is there that might jump out at you that's very peculiar in Genesis 3.15 that if you were just reading this without knowledge of other things, it might really jump out at you? Is from the male. But he says what here? Seed of woman. That's not, yeah, I don't care where you find out, it, in any culture, whatever, they'll talk about usually the seed as associated with the male. And, that, and going through the Bible, it, it follows that consistently, except here. I don't know what they thought when they first heard this, knowing. The, the, the laws of procreation and what they thought. But with all we know the Bible teaches, developed further by the teaching of Isaiah 7 and 14 that a, a virgin would bear a son. And Matthew 1 tells us and quotes Isaiah 7 and 14 concerning that makes it rather quickly an uh, opportunity to take a text there and preach a sermon on the virgin birth of Christ. Now, Paul, and Ken, I think, was referring to that. Paul used that, but he used it from the standpoint of, um, of Abraham. Uh, Abraham's uh, uh, promise made to Abraham. In verse 29, and if you be Christ then are you Abraham's seed, singular, and heirs according to the promise. But there it's associated with the male. Here it's associated with a woman. I will put enmity or hate between thee and the woman, and between thy seed, your descendants. Now, how, does that mean that Satan actually physically sired people on this earth? Who are the seed of, of Satan? Jesus said something to the Jews one time. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a liar from the beginning and a murderer. Well, they weren't conceived by some sort of miraculous involvement of the devil, who's a spirit being. Well, how have they become his children? By what we do, by what we believe, and what we don't believe, 
And they were simply living contrary to the law of Moses, and they were dishonest and all of that. So he will put enmity. This is God speaking to the, to, uh, the serpent. And between thy seed and her seed, singular, it shall bruise thy head. It what? The seed, the woman's seed, shall bruise thy head, Satan's head, and thou, Satan, shall bruise his heel. A head wound is always considered what? Fatal. Fatal. Why heel wound with the seed of woman? Compared to, comparatively speaking. It's not a lethal mortal blow. And so here, look what's wrapped up in these few verses. It's, it's just amazing to me what God can say in so few words. And yet he says, he says what he's going to be revealing in thousands of words all the way through down to the time Christ came. Also what's interesting is Satan himself didn't understand how this was going to happen. Now we, we know he's a very powerful being, more powerful than most of us realize. He's a spirit being. He doesn't function like we do. He seeks our destruction. But he thought, evidently, with Christ being killed on the cross, he won the day. Which tells us that spirit being up there in whatever eternity is like, and he's able to work on earth and how he works on earth, doesn't mean he knows the counsels of God, does it? So, this thing comes to pass. As we know, in the death of Christ, how he came to die on the cross, and how Satan worked it through wicked men to bring such about. So, I guess we'll have to stop here. Okay, thank you very much.